Well, I mean, you could say this movie is just Tarkovsky wanted to fuck his own imagination. Hmm. <laughs> what if I could fuck my regrets? <laughs> I give you Tarkovsky's entire cinematography. <laughs> That's it. What if I could dig down my regrets? What if my What if my regrets were a neutrino lady? Were a sexy neutrino lady? Okay, take out the neutrino lady bit. You actually have all of Russian literature and cinema. God damn it! I'm still caught up on mustache surgery. Um, uh. <laughs> and I'm surprised that you didn't make the bit of that guy and not Korolev because it's like you can't have an open casket funeral his mustache surgery was just so bad <laughs> it's like fully his fully his pace his 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 entire face peeled back except for the little bit with the mustache it's like yeah sorry uh, instructions oh, unclear no, no, no. The, his mustache <laughs> his upper lip is entirely missing it, it's um <laughs> it's fury road when fury like kills a uh, oh Warden god a quick shot i'm just like the jaw has been ripped off and fleshy blood. You know what I'm talking about? Just at Walter Reed, there's just a tow truck in there and they put the hook under your lip and then they just pull the winch <laughs> and it just goes. So what we're saying here is that John Bolton was a place with body double Saddam style. <laughs> but somehow kept a mustache. Every, 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 yeah, like the Saddam doubles were not based on how much they looked like Saddam. It was acting ability and they just got a new face. From Saddam, and then the face grew back, which is what faces do. I just had this thought that, like, Saddam replaces his son with a double to protect his son, and then later has beef with his own son, and then kills the double, completely forgetting that he made the double. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn it. This is a non-zero chance. Having, having a double of your son is just a, a recipe. Like, you could just get another, you could just keep the good one. What you have to remember is that the mustache has to accept the user or it dies. Mm, okay, yeah, there might be some, like, rejection. Okay, so now I'm thinking, like, Deus Ex, um, like, implants, where if you don't mm -hmm. take a certain drug, they rot. So the mustache would just, like, fully, like, there would be black veins coming out of your upper lip. No, it will flat out kill you in five minutes. Are we now inventing the Eldritch mustache? No, so, yeah, so, so what, what we are doing right now, what we are collectively doing is what, Soler is what Solaris does to try and understand humans of just like, like, all right, so it's got this skin stuff around it, but then it's got this like stringy stuff on top. I don't, I don't get this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making it out. I'm, I'm making it out of fucking neutrinos. Atoms are stupid. That's it though, right? Because like Stanislaw Lem was writing a book about like the trouble of communication and understanding different cultures and like yeah. beings in existence. He was trying to talk about the challenges of understanding and communication and Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky, like, out the window. He's like, fuck that. I work with you, but fuck that. I wonder if you think about regrets. Dead wife. <laughs> Dead wife regrets. Christopher Nolan is somehow here. You know? <laughs> all right. All right. I, I, and again, amazing movie. But like Tarkovsky just sitting down with like the Kremlin, just like, all right, so what if, what if a guy's wife was dead? What if, what if a man had regrets about his dead wife? We've gotten so far off the reservation right now. So let's reel it back in. We're in, Fine. we're in our, Where we're in. Where the fuck are we? We're in Guderian's oh, okay. room. We're in Guderian's room. room. Yeah, sorry, no, that's I lost the audio, guys. Sorry, I heard sorry. you say Guderian for a second. I was just like, I'm all right, immediately off the reservation the again. Okay. Heinz Kaderian Barin. has entered the reservation. Yes. We've got, the last thing I heard before the audio issue was Quinn saying he goes to Gabarian's room and there is a note. And yeah, so he goes to Gabarian's room and there is a note and the note is a child's drawing of a stick figure hanging from a noose um, and written on it is the word human being. So something fucked has gone on. Chris goes in. The room is completely trashed. He finds, among other things, a pistol and Gabarian has left him a note. Or a video, a video recording, um, because this is the future. First off, he does this repeatedly. Um, he insists that he is sane. He is not insane. Everything going on is happening, and he is reasoning through it with his logical mind. The way he describes it, Gabarian describes like, I am going to commit suicide because I have logicked myself into it. I am not insane. This is the optimal thing to do as a scientist. He described it as like, I'm afraid that this is only the beginning. And so in order to avoid what comes next, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This was legitimately unsettling. I mean, you saw it in like, I was like, I was like, oh goodness. And we also uh, find out that throughout all of this kind of in the background, this is the, uh, I think one of like the few nods to the sci-fi that is still around is these two factions about what to do about Solaris and what to do about, um, 
all of this weird shit going on. So Gabarian, he wants to bombard the planet with X-ray lasers. Uh, and this is something that he says Sartorius agrees with him about and that Snout is vehemently against. And this is also, crucially, this is what um, Chris wanted to do back when he was on Earth. Whenever he was arguing with Burton, he just said, like, yeah, maybe we should just glass the place. Science without ethics, you know? Yeah, and Burton says, like, we are, like, science doesn't have ethics. We are the people who apply ethics to it. We make it moral or immoral. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. that. And then he tells Chris, like, don't make science immoral. Uh, another thing is that, as we talked about before, Gabarian has in his room a giant window that just points out into the black, endless, starless void, presumably to stare at, to gaze into the void, and then the void gazes back, uh, which is what Chris does. He gazes into the void for so long. I was expecting a jump scare. Nothing happened. This movie did make me think a lot about how manufactured entertainment is these days. The, the fact that I'm watching this and I have been trained to expect things to happen very formulaically. Yes, you've been trained. You are you are the product, Quinn. You have been you have been programmed by cheap tricks and yeah. predictable algorithm like. And all, all I'm thinking is like, here's how Michael Bay would have done this. That is a cursed idea, Michael Bay Solaris. Um, oh, God. <laughs> well, just but like, I mean, I don't know how what the average Russian Soviet cinema go where like 72 was going for i mean they had the westerns and stuff and they had a few sci-fi films you guys have watched some of them but like i think even then sort of been very like because I mean, movie isn't scary but it's, it's disconcerting it puts you at unease i feel like yeah and i feel like that a lot of people in 72 were like Ugh. like just maybe not a jump scare but like what's on this window why like i feel uncomfortable here yeah and i should not say that nothing happens while he's looking out this window because he sees someone walk behind him he sees the reflection in this window, a woman in blue, in a blue robe, walks past and around the corner. And Chris goes to chase her down, and he keeps seeing her, like, just a little bit around the corner, and then a little bit around the next corner. She keeps following him, and she takes him to a freezer. And whenever he goes in, there's no one there except Gabarian's corpse. Sorry, he he has met Sartorius by this time. I'm getting my, my scenes a little mixed up. So, at first, after he goes to Gabarian's room, he goes to meet Sartorius. Uh, and Sartorius is a dick. He's played by Solonitsyn. And where Snout is this very, like, he's this bedraggled, like, he looks like a survivor in a in a system shock game. Sartorius still looks like the perfect uh, scientist. He His clothes are immaculate. He looks a little tired. He's still got his glasses. And he is doing his job, goddammit. He's, like, incredibly dismissive of Chris. Whenever he leaves uh, his room, he doesn't allow Chris in. And he, like edges through the door opening it as t like as little as possible he he's like uh, dismissive of gabarian's death he calls him a coward he thoroughly establishes himself as like the cold pragmatist yeah and ratcheting up chris's suspicions as sartorius is talking someone is trying to open the lab door from inside and sartorius is just like nope nope holding it back <laughs> yeah he's holding it back and then just as chris is about to leave the door like opens a crack and a dude runs out and tries to get away from this lab before before Sartorius manhandles him back into the lab uh, and then tries to gaslight Chris. Just picks all him up and throws him back in. Yeah, like the so the dude the dude is a little person. Yeah, he's, he's wearing a, a it's just it, and it's never explained. This is never explained. He never comes back. That, that is something I that is something I wish that they had shown. They. Uh, and I might, this is getting a little ahead. They never show or talk about Snouts or Sartorius' guests, the visitors that they have. Yeah, they're like Pokemon that never come back. Yeah. So like, like in both cases, the two scientists are like just trying to hide it. Like, you see yeah. they're totally different styles of people, but like they're both like, don't see, don't see. Which is wild because as soon as Chris, as soon as Hari shows up, Snout is, everyone's just like, yeah, this is completely normal. Uh, Snout says something like, if I told you, you wouldn't have believed me. It's like, well, no, you could have, sh you could have showed him. You could have showed him the person you have in your lab. Snout's visitor is just lazy. Sartorius' okay. <laughs> visitor just wants to get out because God only knows what's happening. Well, yeah, because Sartorius, as established, like, he's a scientist. He, he views them, he views his, okay, so this isn't jumping ahead We're because we figure, we figure this just out in this going. exact scene. So... 
Chris, he, he gets led around another one of these mysterious people who are not supposed to be on the station. This woman in blue leads him to the freezer where uh, Gabarian's corpse is. So he goes back to Gabarian's room and he watches the rest of the message. And in the background of that message, in this in this videotape, it is not a hallucination. The girl is in the video and she picks up a glass of water and hands it to Gabarian. Um, and throughout this, he kind of, he keeps talking about how, you know, humans are not meant to be here. Um, and he keeps insisting that he is not insane, that this is a like rational response to what is going on. And and you mentioned that he was like scared for what was coming in the future, Chris. I I interpreted it. I you know either of these could be true. I guess I interpreted him as kind of going like, "Hey, if I kill myself, this is something that could like ravage Earth. I need to make sure that this station doesn't have people on it." Although I guess in that case he would have killed the others. It's kind of like the thing, right? Where it's the idea was, yeah, uh, Wilfred Brimley and thing is like, yeah, this is bad. It's going to spread across Earth. We need to stop this. We need to lock ourselves down. Probably kill ourselves. Gabarian's kind of like that. And, you know, I feel like in all of these scenes, like Burton kind of mentions it, but then Sartorius and Snout and Gabarian, I think as well, they all say some variation of like, yeah, you, you just got to experience it yourself. We can't tell you, which is a really interesting thing. Cause it's like, you know, Chris should be aware of like, Hey, some of these, why are these, these children here? These lady, like what's going on in this ship, but you got to experience it yourself. I guess. One thing I do love about this movie is how he experiences it the first time. Uh, because holy shit, his reaction. <laughs> so Chris falls asleep. One little line I really like that Snout says earlier is just like, oh, just pick a room, which really does bring across that like, yeah, there's there are now 83 free bedrooms on this fucking station <laughs> that he can pick. <laughs> OK, his room is honestly so good. Yeah. And and his room compared to everyone else's is completely bare and empty. Um, also, the station is in a ring, so all of the hallways, we get a, a scene later where Snout, like, fully runs all the way around the ring. But yeah, Chris's room is very, like, empty, it's very sterile, there's a bed, there's a chair, and that's kind of it. And he falls asleep in his new room with Gabarian's gun in his hand. Not only is it sterile, the bed has, like, one of those plastic covers over the sheets. Oh yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. yeah. For the entirety of the, uh, the series. Or not so like it, it, again, it, it's like it's very much like 60s, 70s sci-fi, but it has this sort of like, again, timelessness in a retro timelessness kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Which I just appreciated. And in, in the set design, they actually did bring in um, like rocket scientists to talk about this. Um, one of the props they had was an entire like by that time, 20 year old giant computer bank that they just wheeled into the lab. So he wakes up. He's got the gun in his hand. He wakes up and there's someone with him. Hari, his wife, who has been dead for 10 years. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. Um, <laughs> I like this. Like I said, I like this reaction. She has no awareness of this. She wakes. She seems to wake up, whether she's playing an act or not, we don't know at this point. This person uh, who looks like Hari, who has materialized in his bed, just seems to be waking up and hanging out with her husband. Chris he he immediately plays the role. He does not freak out. He does not try and like explain the situation or say, hey, you're dead or anything like that. He, as an act, as a ruse, he starts playing along with the morning routine and he makes multiple covert attempts to grab the fucking gun. And one of them, the gun is like down by Hari's foot and he goes for it and he accidentally taps her foot and she's like, like, oh, come on, Chris, you know, I'm ticklish and accidentally kicks the gun across the room. So he he tries to flee the room and we learn something else, which is that these um, these people, these visitors, these guests, they at first they cannot be apart from this, the person that they are tied to. So she says like she is also getting freaked out because she knows that something is wrong. She does not. She says she doesn't feel like herself. And as he goes to leave the room, she says that she has some feeling that she has to stay close to him, like that she is tied to him. So he blasts her into fucking space. That scene is drawn out and kind of uncomfortable. It sh it should be. You hear her screaming. The entire fucking time. So without the gun, he tricks her into a rocket and he fires it off of Solaris. Like this is an escape capsule that Solaris has. He like tricks her into it. He, he gets her into a spacesuit. Um, he has to like help her put it on. And 
like says, all right, you sit down right there. I'm going to be back in a minute. And then slams the, the slams the hatch, <laughs> fires the escape pod. Yeah, this this goes on so long and he immediately gets his comeuppance, uh, his karma, because he does not leave the fucking like the silo in time. He is trapped in this launch silo with this rocket and he gets lit on fire. So, some professional stuntman got fully lit on fire for this. <laughs> Yeah, he should be reduced to a goo, but that's just me. Well, he has some kind of like there's some baffles and he leaves the scene. Uh, his his leather jacket that we love is like burnt up and it's smoking. No, was that the leather jacket? I no, thought that he was, was wearing the like uniform. a yeah, yeah. He, he was wearing oh, like he, a, he had the space. Yeah, the suit. Yeah, he wasn't wearing the, the fish leather jackets net. are protected. Listen, yeah. he wasn't wearing the fishnet T-shirt and a jacket. <laughs> Oh, um, I said for leather jackets are good. I didn't say the rest of the outfit was good. Yeah, <laughs> or the or the pants that are literally plastered to his legs. Or the weird sweatshirt. Yeah, I did think that it was really funny that you have like a mid forties or early fifties dude with like a dad bod that's wearing like these like skin tight pants and like a fishnet yeah. shirt. <laughs> yeah, why didn't we fucking mention that during his introduction to the station? Why are you wearing that, sir? Yeah, he's he's dressed kind of like an action hero, but he he does not look it, which I like. I like that he's not ripped. I like oh God, that he's, he's dressed like Bruce Willis in The Fifth Element. He's yeah. a shitty Bergheim dad. 